at the beginning uh, each week, we like to just start with a little bit of context on, on what's happened the week previous and where we're heading. Um, I feel like I could just copy and, and paste in a lot of what we said last couple of weeks. Clearly hard days for everybody. Um, a lot of losses, um, a lot of fear, a lot of concern about the sustainability of our community and what's going to happen uh, when we start to even consider reopening uh, at some point in the future. Um, there are some fantastic resources that have been assembled by a lot of our partner organizations. We're not going to go through them uh, and just read off a bunch of links, but certainly resources are available about what's happening with implementation of the CARES Act. There's some fantastic resources about what's happening state by state in terms of um, the early signs of unemployment insurance and, and how that process is working. Um, and again, we can circulate some of those links to you when we send the YouTube link around with the archives to the show, if, if, if you need those, or you can reach us again at musicpolicyforum at gmail.com. Um, today, we're, we're gonna start real quick when, and bring in a, a special guest, uh, an announced guest, lucky y'all. Um, but we are very excited to welcome Storm Glore, who's uh, a friend of many of you uh, in this program. Storm is one of the leading experts uh, and educators on music cities uh, in the world, and, and certainly in the United States. And, uh, from his perch at University of Colorado Denver, Storm is co-curating and co-hosting a very exciting event that's taking place next April 23rd and 24th. And we just wanted to offer Storm a minute to talk about that event and just provide some information uh, in case anybody here in this conversation would uh, like to participate. So Storm, do you want to take it away for a minute? You bet. Thanks, Michael. And, and um, thank you for uh, having this weekly event. This has, been, this has been great. And hats off to the Music Policy Forum and Music Cities together. And we're very proud that you all are partners in what we're doing. But uh, Gigi Johnson at UCLA and I uh, uh, both teach Music Cities courses. And we were going to present at South by Southwest. And we all know how that turned out. But uh, after that, we decided to try to have an online forum gathering Music Cities scholars and professionals and, and folks in government positions together. And it's turned into a 25 hour long uh, conference next week. And uh, it's one of those situations where there were so many interested parties and so many great speakers who wanted to come to the conversation. Uh, that that we have we we made it so, and these folks will be from all over the world. Thus, the the cons consecutive hours and allowing for all the time zones. So, so we're really excited. Uh, we hope you can join us. I, I hope that uh, you see the the link to our website in the <laughs> chat session, and I hope you can go there. Uh, but if you have any questions about it, I'm so easy to reach. Stormglor at gmail.com. S T R M G L O O R. If you have any questions in particular. But I do want to thank uh, Music Policy Forum and Music Cities together who have partnered with us on this event, and, and uh, we hope you can join us. Thank you, Storm. We are, um, really appreciate your leadership and, and Gigi's leadership, and, and this is, you know, obviously part of what we're all going through collectively is a process of, um, you know, not only having to challenge the way we communicate and we share ideas and, and we collaborate, but also the upside of that, which is the opportunity to sort of engage in this global 25 hour long, um, you know, really exciting uh, conversation and, and just really, you know, kind of push the form of, of conferences and symposia and things like that. So we're super yeah. excited for uh, to see what this looks like next week. Uh, I Thank have you. no idea how many hours uh, I will be participating because <laughs> 25 seems like about uh, a few more than I can handle, but we're yeah. excited. So thanks for, for joining us, Storm, and, and we look forward to Thursday, Friday. All right. Thanks for your time. Glad to sure. be here today. Sure. So now we're going to turn to uh, the formal kind of meat of today's agenda. And what we really wanted to do is turn the spotlight. Yeah, again, each week we really want to focus on some core themes. And last week we really spent a lot of time talking about artist perspectives and how professional musicians were navigating this transition or, or navigating the situation. And now we want to look a little bit more at how communities and uh, community-wide response and, and what that's looking like with the idea that, I, that there should be some ideas or best practices or strategies that should resonate with everybody at this meeting because everybody in today's conversation at some level is part of a music scene, part of a community, and ideally are thinking along parallel or similar lines and hopefully will be inspired uh, or challenged by some of what you hear today. So I'm gonna bring in Don Pitts, uh, our partner again in the Music Cities Together uh, partnership. Don, are you, where are you at? I'm here. There you are. 
So Don, why don't you go ahead and, and introduce uh, Bruce and Jamie and, and uh, lead this conversation about what's happening in Columbus, Ohio. All right, thank you. Uh, hello, everybody else, Mira and Eric and all the other, other panelists today. Uh, I've known Bruce for a couple of years. I've had the pleasure of having many talks with him and uh, I've been a fan of what they've been doing in, in Columbus for a couple of years now. And they're really, I think, doing some clever things uh, during this pandemic. So uh, I'm glad that you were able to bring Bruce. I was glad you were able to bring Jamie to this, to this thing today. Uh, but can you, Bruce, can you tell us a little bit what's going on in, in Columbus and what you guys are doing? So let me start my video, okay. Um, well, i just quickly give you a little insight to, and a lead up to why we're doing what we're doing. You know, we're the fourth, 14th largest city in America and we're a young city, but we're a city of 900,000 people. When I say young, we've never suffered from industrial rust. We're a white collar, you know, economy. We're not on a major river. And so we're philanthropic. And it's a small city where everybody is fairly well connected. You're only one degree of separation. So our city and our state threw down immediately in every way possible. In fact, Governor DeWine was the first governor to step up to the plate and institute social distancing. So what we've done is we've put up a switchboard on our website with all kinds of information, you know, where people can apply, where you can stream your stuff. And we've also been working with the governor of the state to create PSAs with artists that have come from Columbus, OAR and Rascal Flats. And we even got our jazz uh, orchestra involved and our symphony involved. And we've taken the process that we call Music Business Mondays, where we have major players in the music industry come to Columbus speak to an audience on a variety of topics, and we are taking it virtual this coming Monday. So we have 300 and something participants, and this one is gonna be um, a ultimate blindfold listening test where 130 artists from the area have submitted songs, it's being culled down, and then the head of Universal Music Publishing and a and will be ev evaluating these songs. We've partnered with our film commission. Uh, John Doherty runs the film commission, has done a contest, a short film contest, where three filmmakers from the region will win prizes to, for their uh, submitted short films. And we, as a music commission, are providing an opportunity for our music makers to, who are at home to create scores for these three winning films, and we're offering cash prizes. And um, we've basically, through the PSAs we were asked to do, we approached another one of our wonderful stations here, NBC4, and they not only aired the PSAs, but they created a segment called Music Matters in Columbus. And this way the artists are on from home. In fact, one of our wonderful singers you know, runs a, Run, heads of band called Mojo Flow, Amber Nicole, who I think's on this call. She did a spot. And uh, Alex, why don't you show that real quick? Hi, Ohio. My name is Amber Nicole. I'm from Columbus. And I just wanted to bring you a little light and positivity during this quarantine. <laughs> And you can support the local arts community by donating to the Greater Columbus Arts Council COVID-19 Emergency Relief Fund. You'll find a link to that on NBC4i.com and click on Coronavirus in Ohio, how you can help. That's, so that's just one of the other things we've done. We try to be creative to keep our musicians engaged on a creative level, as opposed to just handing them out a bunch of links to Music Cares or GCAC, Greater Columbus Arts Council here. Um, why don't I just hand it over to Jamie Goldstein, who's our VP of 
the Greater Columbus Arts Council in charge of marketing, communication, and events, who is a very close partner of ours. And just to say that we're partnering with all kinds of other organizations and city government. So, Jamie, take it away. You Thanks, Bruce. Um, and Amber, your video makes me so happy. I just texted you that, but thank you. <laughs> um, I, please, if, if I start to get a little verklempt, uh, I, I might, uh, can't seem to talk about all of the good things happening in Columbus lately without getting a little teary. So um, we, uh, the Greater Columbus Arts Council is a private nonprofit. We receive the majority of our funds from the, um, the Hotel Melto bed tax, a portion of it as well as from a new admissions fee that was leveraged um, and put in place in, in um, December of 2018, but actually enacted in July of 2019. Um, we are now at zero revenue <laughs> for either of those things at the moment. So we're, we're in the process of revising budgets. Um, we're a very small staff. We're only 13 people. We're very nimble. Um, and we, we, uh, there's about 4,000 local arts councils in the country. Um, less than half of them support artists with grants um, and, and almost none of them do it um, in a way that is non-competitive, right? So um, in, in the before times, as a friend of mine <laughs> has recently phrased it, we um, have a support for professional artists grant program that um, provides artists of all disciplines up to $1,750 to, to buy equipment, to do work, to, to, uh, to, you know, to take classes, to whatever it might be that helps them um, further their professional career. Um, and we recently, um, you know, when, when all of this hit, as Bruce mentioned, DeWine was one of the first governors to, you know, sort of close the state down and really start to, to be proactive with this effort. We, um, because we're small and nimble, I'm grateful. And because we have wonderful community partnerships, we very quickly pivoted to, um, ter we made a $150,000 commitment from our own funds and began a fundraising effort to raise money to do a COVID um, artist relief fund grant program. So uh, to date, we have given 253 artists uh, over uh, nearly $220,000. And we today are, thanks to a couple really generous gifts, are reopening that grant fund for a third round. Artists have been able to request up to $1,000. This most recent round is going to be top request 850. Um, but we know the stimulus checks are slow in coming out, right? And we're, we're really trying to make sure that we get people and we turn them a grant, we, we review them and the checks are cut on the Friday after the, of the Tuesday deadline. So we are, we are moving very quickly to get money into artist hands. We've had a lot of musicians apply, um, but again, across all disciplines, this is um, to replace funds that they've lost specifically from, from the COVID crisis. Um, and the, the stories, um, are heartbreaking and also heartwarming. We've had so many kind words. And this is, I think, um, one of the key things that a local arts council can do in this time is really provide these kinds of resources. Um, in, again, in the before times and in the after times, <laughs> um, we also, you know, collaborate and now we collaborate across the community. So we're very close to the music commission. Uh, the Film Commission is actually part of the Greater Columbus Arts Council. Um, and we have this crazy thing in Columbus, which you may have heard about, which is called the Columbus Way. The um, Harvard Business School has written a paper about it, and uh, it grew out of um, a bicentennial celebration we had in 2012. But we, um, we align across sectors all the time. We have a regular, I just had one today, a uh, Columbus marketers group. So we've got the convention center, the airport, our Experience Columbus, our, our CBB on there, us, um, major attractions in the city. And we all come and talk about what's going on and how we can help each other. Um, and we, we have maintained that and done it as a monthly thing for now almost 10 years. And this is really helping us um, um, weather this crisis in a way. Not only is it emotionally and personally supportive to the people in, in the sectors, but it's helping us find solutions. So we have um, a really cool effort that was started out of um, um, the Columbus Partnership and the Smart Columbus Initiative, which was we got one of the grants 
costs for um, for transportation that happened not too long ago. Uh, I think it was three years, and um, they basically created a hackathon. So they have about 1,200 people who have engaged in a variety of ways on a channel called Can't Stop CBUS, mm-hmm. and they're helping to provide solutions to to community problems. So that has to do with with delivering meals. um, And there's a major arts component to it too. And one of those components in the arts front is a curbside concerts initiative. So we are, um, GCAC has committed money from one of our regular programs, which is a street performer program that we pay artists. We don't have any licensing issues in Columbus um, or permit issues for people to be on the street and performing. But we've partnered with entities, whether it's the Short North Gallery Hop or our North Market or the airport, or the convention center to to pool dollars to make sure that musicians um, and street performers are getting at least $50 an hour for their time per musician. And we've been running that program for five years and it's been huge. We have a couple hundred artists in the directory. We manage all the payments and booking and we've lent that to this curbside concert efforts because people, the requests are off the charts right now. Um, This is specifically to request concerts for elderly folks who are shut in, right? Mm -hmm. So anyone can request a concert and um, the musician gets paid um, a set fee for a shift. Uh, Reichert, which is one of our local automotive dealers, has donated the, the, the pickup trucks that the musicians travel around on and they pull up and they perform and they, and based on the locations of the requests, we plan a route so that that musician for a four hour shift has multiple concerts that they do during that period. And it's been very important to us. They can accept tips, so that's helping them too, but that they're also getting paid to do this. We have had wonderful musicians like Amber who have offered to donate their time. And we, we, as, a, as an agency, we, have, we never ask artists to do things for free, period. I get requests all the time. Can you, know, can you give me a list of artists that we could ask to come and play for exposure? At our, at our event, whatever. And you know what? You can't pay rent with exposure. You can't buy groceries with exposure. And I always decline those requests. If you have some budget, if you're going to pay an artist, I will help connect you with artists. But other than that, um, you know, we, we feel very strongly that every artist deserves to be paid for their time. And I think that, that that mindset as a whole is really important for the leaders in any community to have and to understand that um, artists, um, uh, their time is valuable. What they have done to train for all of that is, um, is invaluable. And the, um, and the sense of hope and connection that they bring us, particularly in times like this, is priceless. So um, we're doing everything that we can. I'm happy to share links and I'll, Alex, I'll send you the links to our COVID grant program so that folks can see. We were one of the leaders, um, one of the first three cities to roll out a program like this and we will have invested um, over $300,000 in grants to artists when we're all said and done. That's, that's great. I, I love the, the, the cross sector collaboration. I know that's, it's, I've always thought that it was the key to, to really having some success across the community. Michael, how are we on time? We've got about five minutes on, on this. And, and actually I have a question um, if I could for, for Bruce and Jamie. I'm, I'm curious, you know, one of the sort of immediate challenges that I think we're all feeling is the sort of dichotomy that we know that there's gonna be massive federal resources spent and decisions made about the next wave of relief funding in the next uh, month or so. But the you know, concern that you know, we hear consistently is, is how does music put themselves into that sort of funding stream and, and try to get some of those resources. I'm curious if you've had any insight or experience being a state capital with access to state leaders as a way to advocate for more federal resources, or if that's something where you just haven't been as engaged with Governor DeWine and his team? Um, absolutely, actually we are. Um, so we have, um, we have an organization or a loose organization, a couple of them. One is the Columbus Cultural Leadership Consortium, which is um, a group of our largest arts leaders that comes together on a regular basis. We have, from those folks, formed a reopen task force to make sure that we're addressing the needs for performing arts organizations 
in theater spaces is very different than attractions like a museum where you can still find ways perhaps to limit the number of people in the space and maintain social distance. Mm -hmm. So making sure that our, um, our electeds understand the differences in this. Um, so for the Columbus Association for Performing Arts, which brings Broadway and also other performances in, um, they can't sell half a house. They can't sell a third of a house. They need, they need to be able to fall back on force majeure in order to make sure they don't lose they don't lose everything, right? And so the, any reopen policy that happens, and the same would be for movie theaters or sporting, any place where you're shoulder to shoulder with someone in an audience, um, our electeds, we, we might like to assume that they understand this, but, right. but we know, but we know I've, I worked in state government for 16 years, we know that that's not the case. Right. You can't ever assume anything. They're also being barraged from all sides, right? And so um, Tom Katzenmeyer, our president and CEO, is right in there with, um, with our key decision makers and stakeholders. He's a longtime government guy, worked in Governor Celeste's office and has great connections. And he's making sure that our voices are being heard at the level they need to as we begin reopening. And I think that's critical for anyone. That's a message that everyone needs to hear. And if you don't feel like you're at the table there, find a way to be. Because uh, I worry, because every state is different, that, that they're gonna, there are going to be arts organizations that are left behind or left in the lurch because all of a sudden the reopen guidelines screw them in a major right. way, right? right. And so, um, uh, you know, I'm happy to chat with anybody, you know, offline on, on helpful ways to do this. Um, but yeah, it's very important that you're, that you're in there and you're part of that conversation in some way. And I appreciate that so much, Jamie, because it, it feels like you're, you're touching on, you know, the two critical issues or two of the critical issues that, that we're all struggling with, which is, first of all, how, do, how does our sector even get to the reopening point? Because so many members in our community are so extraordinarily vulnerable as institutions or venues or individual artists, et cetera. And then how do we make sure that as we get into the different stages of reopening, that we are in that early conversation and, and that we are not just simply, you know, the last in, in line to kind of be, be moving forward. And, and, and for you and, and Bruce and everybody in today's meeting, that is really where we spent most of our energies last two weeks at Music Policy Forum and Music Cities Together starting to get our head around, okay, how can we contribute to kind of bridging those communities between public health, between you know our sector, again with a with a very pragmatic eye towards not conceptually what needs to happen, but literally how are we going to do this and what is that going to look like? And I think positioning yourself as wanting to be part of the solution. Exactly. You know, we're we're having um, a really big conversation in the arts as a whole right now, um, and I'm happy to share a document I just got that is about the arts sector and reopening and so, and thoughts there. And I think that would be probably interesting to everyone. Um, we have, to, um, we have to be at the table. We have to help our elected officials understand what's at stake for each one of our institutions. And we also have to understand that we are, start we are a part of restarting the economy. Right. Getting our musicians working again, getting our artists working again is a critical piece of this, just like any other industry. And, um, and you cannot say that message enough, right? Um, it, we know in the marketing industry, repeat, 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 repeat. <laughs> yep. So wherever, wherever we are, where, where, whoever we're talking to, we're, we're talking about this. We're also, making, we're also making sure that people are hearing the message about the importance of the arts to our, our mental and physical health, right? I mean, anyone who has ever been soothed by a song or felt calmer or more contemplative by reading a piece of poetry understands the value of the arts. And I think we have a unique moment in time here because people are missing this shit, right? right. I mean, all of a sudden, it's like the day without art. It's like the year without art. It's like the, you know, the year the music died, right? We are, people are realizing, I think, more than ever what the arts bring to their lives. And so we need to capitalize on this, on this, on this moment in time as much as we can and, and help bring that home to folks for support going forward. Yep. A day without music is like a day without oxygen. That's hmm. a good, uh, can we put that on a t-shirt, Bruce? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so Don, do you have any more um, things you want to flag here on the Columbus conversation specifically before we turn to Cascadia? No, well, I wanted to just, to, I think going back and revisiting the mastering of a music city and all of their work, 
uh, I think the work that the Columbus Music Commission has been doing uh, kind of shows the difference between that arm's length organization that was mentioned in the, you know, we have city government and offices uh, that are focused on the music sector and you have the arm's length organizations. Uh, most of my uh, folks, m most of my old colleagues in the government music sector positions have actually been on a, on a communication lockdown for the mm -hmm. last month. And so it's just, I, I think I was talking to Bruce yesterday or today, and we were just talking about how the, the, the benefits that they have of being, being associated with the city government, but not, not directly involved in it. So Bruce, can you elaborate on that? Or what was your red tape comment? Well, we have relationships throughout the city with the business community, with the government community, with all of the arts organizations. But GCAC and ourselves, we are funded nonprofits. We are not city organizations. So though we're respectful of due diligence the city is doing or their guidelines, we're not We're not muted. Mm -hmm. In fact, those organizations look to us to be creative. They look at us as we're the go-to organizations. We've constantly, as Jamie said, is selling the value of the arts, including music, of course, from my end, as not only a cultural asset, but as a financial asset. So we don't, we really, and Jamie can speak to this, she's been in government. I've only been in this position for just less than two years that I find this to be a city that we don't have to do any unlearning. Mm -hmm. We don't have to go back and deal with things that are laborious to us. It's a real smooth path. Jamie, what are you, what's your thought about that? You're muted, Jamie. Yeah. There you go. Uh, on you. Um, I think any community will face its challenges, right? And certainly we, we still encounter those too. It's not all um, sunshine and roses. Um, but I do believe, I'm not from Columbus. I'm actually from that state up north, as they like to refer to down here. I went to the University of Michigan. Um, I've lived around the country, LA, St. Louis. I chose to stay in Columbus because this city has this incredible Co cooperative and collaborative feel to it, even before it got sort of structured under the bicentennial. Mm -hmm. And, and so that, that opens doors, right? When you have cross sector conversations happening and you're constantly talking amongst each other, amongst, amongst yourselves and with each other about the importance of each piece to, to the, the bigger plan, that really helps. The Urban Land Institute yesterday, Michael Bargiorno, our board chair, who's an architect, um, was one of the presenters on a on a um, a webinar about community resiliency, right? And it has to do around design, but community resiliency is something we should all be concerned about, right? How we respond to both ac acute stress situations like the current and the chronic stressors, which are homelessness and and poverty and um, all of those things, and so as we can be at the table, we need to be at the table, right? And so I would, I'm happy to chat with anyone who feels like in their community, they're struggling with how to get there because I've spent my entire life making sure that the arts were at the table. And, and it's not always pleasant. And sometimes you have to push. Um, and sometimes you have to like say, I want, I want, I want, I want to repeatedly <laughs> um, or find the right person to get you in. But, um, but it is critical. That's great. All right. Bruce and Jamie, thank you so much for joining us today to talk about Columbus. Um, it thank is you. really exciting. Don referenced uh, the work that our MPF partner, Amy Terrell, uh, helped lead uh, several years ago, the Mastering of a Music City. And it's so amazing to watch theoretical reports sort of turning into action and specific sort of strategies and the way that Columbus, among other cities, are, are really taking the ball and running with it is, is super exciting. Uh, one of the things I'll follow up with with Bruce and Jamie on uh, are just any other links or resources that we should uh, distribute uh, in our sort of after report that we're going to send out um, this weekend or early next week so everybody on this meeting can get access to that uh, along with contact information for, uh, for Bruce and Jamie if you want to follow up. So thank you, Columbus. And so now we get to go farther west up to the great northwest. And Kate Becker, are you still with us? Yes, I am. 
Hey, I'm here. Yes. Oh, I got to start the video, I guess. Yeah, Sorry. I got to start the video. There you go. Sorry. Yeah. So, Hi, Kate, we're going to ask you to kind of lead our conversation with our colleagues from Portland and, and from Boise. Before uh, we get to that, just real quickly, you've been so kind to join us uh, a couple times over the last month to talk about what's happening in King County and, and just all the crisis. And I don't want to take time uh, too much in today's conversation because we're, we're going to be pressed on time. But is there a very short update you can give on, on sort of what the state on the ground is in King County and in the region? And are you doing okay? And, and how are your people? Thank you very much, Michael. Um, yes, I've been in a dual role, both as the creative economy strategist for King County, as well as a public health role, working with the creative industries here and all events over 50. So it's been quite an interesting time working with people who've had to make such painful decisions um, and really try to figure out how they're gonna navigate back into business now. But in general, we're doing all right. We have flattened the curve well here and um, now we're all focused on recovery and how we get back to work and how we get everyone back to work. Um, so that is the focus right now in King County and, and we're gonna have to see how we do collectively, but the goal is that we will start to transition back into things. I don't think we ever get back to normal as we knew it before, maybe that's not a bad thing. Maybe we reinvent what normal is now. Um, but we, we move towards people being able to work and make a living and move freely in society. It's going to take a while still, but we're moving in the right direction. Thank you, Kate. And why don't we welcome in Mira and Eric Gilbert. Are you both with us? Yeah. Hey. Awesome. And I'm going to, Kate, I'm going to get out of the way and let you lead this conversation. Okay. Well, I am delighted to lead this conversation. Um, two colleagues who I've had the great fortune to work with over the last few years, who are truly movers and shakers in their communities in the most earnest um, sense of the word. Like they just get so much done in their respective cities. And so it is my absolute honor to um, be here today with Mary McLaughlin and Eric Gilbert. Um, Mira is a woman on a mission in Portland, Oregon. And uh, she is absolutely a tireless advocate on behalf of the music industry and the music community there. And she makes things happen in record time. It is, it is amazing to watch and be affiliated with her and see what she's been able to do. And equally great is Mr. Eric Gilbert from Boise, who is the founder of Tree Fort Music Fest and the founder of Duck Club, which is a promotion and production company there. And he has also been a champion of all things music and culture and has really put Boise on the map for music, which I bet was not easily done. So absolutely delighted to have you both here. Thank you. Hey, happy to be here. Yeah, happy to be here. How are things going in your respective cities with COVID-19 impact in general? How is Boise? How is Portland? Mary, you wanna go? I, I can go. Um, I think there's been a bit of suspended disbelief after the initial, all the venues shut down and everybody kind of, you know, had that moment. And that happened early and that happened immediately. And I think other industries maybe had a longer come to Jesus moment. Um, but I think music, our first Im impulse was to say, we're all in this together. You know, we are lucky because we've got a very tight and connected community. Um, I think it's changing now as time goes on. I think I'll talk more, but we're in a moment of um, increasing anxiety and um, I'm worried about what's, what's coming. Yeah. Yeah, I think pretty similar. I mean, with Tree Fort happening, you know, it was supposed to happen March 25th. So it was, it was you know, um, the music scene was the first hit here as in many places. And um, Kate, once again, thank you for um, uh, being uh, connected with, with us and helping us understand what what was going on. And um, so Tree Fort was the first sort of, th I, th I think more serious sign for the community that this, the, this was a, uh, you know, what was coming. So, you know, we ended up postponing just two weeks before the festival would have happened. And by the day the festival would have happened, we were on a, a shelter in place for the whole state. So I, I, I feel like, you know, and then, you know, and, and we've, um, we, we've packaged up the festival and shot it into the future best we could. Actually, it's, 
it's about it's currently 90 percent in uh, tact as most tours kind of worked around it and you know we did that in about a week and then it's just been kind of just like getting through the initial um wave of the storm you know i feel like i'm just now even at first i've gotten comfortable um being a homeschool dad to a kindergarten a kindergartner which has been some of the silver lining to be honest but I think collectively now I feel like um, people are starting to peek out from, from afar, but what are we going to do to start on the rebuilding phase? And, you know, definitely a lot of concern around the uh, uh, music scene, but in general, we've all been kind of focused initially on those most vulnerable and doing a lot uh, on, uh, on, on those fronts. So, and then just trying to, I, th I think grapple with the uncertainty is one of the big challenges, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So um, what are your musicians doing right now? And what are you all doing in your respective cities to, to help alleviate pain, to help make it possible for people to have hope for the future? What, you're both doing great things. Can you talk about some of the things you're doing? Yeah, my, my Portland feels and my role in it feels definitely more reactive at this point. I was so... It, it did my heart good to hear Columbus talking about creative engagement and keeping the things that brought us all here in the first place alive, even in the face of crisis. Um, I haven't been doing that much. I am, um, you know, we are a ridiculously underfunded nonprofit, um, grassroots, and it's been me with a few stalwart volunteers helping in parts. So, um, it feels like we have to focus on the things that are kind of the most urgent. And right now getting resources for all different parts of our sector. Um, you know, if you have m music manufacturers of which we have 160 of them in the Portland area um, being pressed out of their, uh, their spaces or unable to keep their spaces, that's a big deal. If you have musicians that are, we are told now not going to be able to apply for unemployment insurance or any of the um, pandemic assistance until late May, early June, which means they're three months without income. And it's, it's an extremely frightening um, thing to discover. So that's just come up in the last couple of days. And then also music venues that are kind of the keystone to this whole story. Because if we come through this and everybody you know, has enough food and, you know, things are okay, but there's no music venues left, um, then the entire economy fails. If musicians have no places to play, they can't live on their streaming revenue, they don't buy microphones, they don't produce records, they don't do all of those things, an entire economy can fail. So I've also been spending a lot of time fighting for and helping with a, a group that's formed to advocate for Oregon venues and working with national organizations and sort of sister initiatives in other places. But yeah, it feels like there's so much, so much to, res to, to help this group for. Like Michael said, hearing abstract data that talks about things with nine zeros on it is completely dead. There's, there's no way to connect to that human. So we've done a lot of time surveying, um, people's conditions. In fact, I'll put up a link that um, points to uh, the results of our last survey. We got in and surveyed our impacted musicians within like March 13th to March 17th. And we did it again uh, a week or so later. And, you know, it's $7 million in lost income from, from 1,500 musicians that reported. And that was a big deal to actually put data and pictures in a way that people could consume. And I think it helped to frame that. I hope that other Music City organizers are, whatever data you have, make it a picture because mm -hmm. it's the only way, it's such a complicated industry and a complicated story. And the only way you can really get people to go, oh, is by simplifying it. So that's kind of where I am. It was amazing, Mara. I think it was the first data that I saw come out of any music city was out of Portland. And you just you just got it done and got it out there. Really impressive. Eric, how's it going yeah. for your music? I think, well, I think so. Similarly, um, I personally haven't been doing a, a, a lot. As you know, it's mostly been kind of like getting a grasp on, on the state of things. But, um, you know, Treeford as as an entity is, you know, I, you know, I appreciate you calling me the founder, but there's a group of us and there's a bunch of us that do a lot of this uh, work. And um, 
not only it's not only a music festival so it's been cool to see that team kind of once we sort of like um you know got through our mo- moment sort of dis- disperse in different ways and trying to help the community in, in a different way so a few things like some folks on our team have been working on this thing called city of good which is a collaboration with the f- the food scene and the, some lo- local growers to um get um meals to those in need and also us helping identify that musicians could be part of that group and um and there's a uh, and then there's some other folks working on a commissioning fund for um for for our artists at large which will include mu- mu- musicians and that's going to be a little more project based grants t- type of thing but tied to a uh, a, a re- relief fund and that's a, cl- a collaboration um with a with the city and and uh, and some some others here then there's been a lot it's been cool to watch musicians kind of take you know as musicians are we're pretty independent in spirit like a lot of them taking initiative around their own streaming or um just ways to sort of raise spirits um so a lot of that's been going on. We've been so supportive of, of that. But I think like Mara was saying, I think one of the big things we identify is that the live music ecosystem at large is one of the biggest things at risk right right now. And so um, without, you know, and so for those that don't know Boise and where we are in a sort of our music cities conversation, we're, we're, we're kind of early on in trying to like um, really educate folks around what a music strategy could look like and getting the players, you know, to uh, gather to put, to, um, put action between that, but we haven't really established any sort of central leadership on that other than um, a few of the non nonprofits and the, and the uh, festival sort of represents sort of the most visible um, gathering point of the uh, music scene. But um, so we've been doing some, you know, definitely been checking in with all our venue partners and helping them on, you know, those that need more um, c- connection to where um, relief can come from. But um, we're 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 going to launch actually a, a Tree Fort Live Music Relief Fund. I think it's going to happen like next week around um, some fundraising we 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 have in place and kind of there's not going to maybe be a, a lot of money around that initially, but we really want to help pe- pe- people understand that the ecosystem needs su- su- support. Yes, the uh, artists do, but like Mary was saying, if if this comes back and all the venues aren't coming back, then um, then, then w- what is there for the mu- musicians to do? But and also really care about like the sound engineers and techs and um, production managers and that broader scene. So, I, I think we're at the very early stages of some of these efforts starting to come together, and it's been really cool to hear what other cities are starting to, w- to work on. And I think it's a good opportunity to fi- figure out maybe how we can better support the music scene moving fo- moving forward and be better prepared for uh, things like this. So. I'm going to jump in. Yeah. Go ahead, Michael. I mean, I think one of the conversations that's been really interesting that we're a lot of people are kind of ping ponging back and forth is what does it look like in this moment of crisis to think about a 2020 version of the WPA, which for our international guests, you know, the Depression era, um, highly popular federal program that basically put resources into a number of industries, but was really where a lot of uh, musicians and writers and, and muralists and others were able to, to have commissioned work during the Great Depression. And one of the things that we're doing that I'm really excited about with this Music Cities Together program is we're actually gonna do a, a Canadian takeover in a couple of weeks. And we're gonna be focusing on some Canadian models that might be the types of things that we could put into the States, again, to bridge the kind of conceptual thinking from mastering of a music city, but then think about actual programs internationally that could really work well in American context that we could go to our, our policymakers and other funders and say, look, we could take that model here. We just need to kind of, you know, we've got the network, we've got the infrastructure, we just need the capital to kind of make it flow. So that, stay tuned on that. That's going to be, um, I think, two weeks from, from now will be that program. Great. Awesome. I'm curious what sort of uh, civic or philanthropic support you're hearing in your respective cities for your whole music ecosystem, including your venues, which is a critical issue here in the Seattle region as well. Um, the, the philanthropic aspect is very thin. Um, I think because Music Portland being less than two years old, we were just starting to get the sort of data that communicated the scope of our music ecology to other non-music stakeholders. And so it felt like we were sort of interrupted in that. If we were a little further along, I think this would be an easier story to tell. We have one local fund that has been 
created specifically to help musicians and only musicians. And it's, you know, less than $50,000 total in resources. And, you know, it's nearly exhausted that. It's very hard to get people to see the music ecology as something different from the arts organizations Mm -hmm. because the arts organizations, you know, artists have always applied for grants and they've always done those things. And a lot of those support mechanisms rely on some relationship to a W uh, to a 501 C three rating. We're a 501 C six because music is a commercial activity and it excludes them from a lot of those things. And it isn't their impulse to go for those sorts of things. So I think musicians haven't been inclined to chase those. Um, They also were anticipating relatively near um, unemployment benefits. And this single local fund that is specific to music is virtually tapped out. So it's, it's it's not a good philanthropic town for music. I'm working with a lot of the funds to make sure that they expand some of their language Mm-hmm. to make it clear that it really is available to musicians because even the way many of them are stated if i was a mu- i would go eh, no if i'm a sound engineer i would absolutely not believe that an artist fund to support creatives was part of it so mm-hmm. there's nothing locally that's set up to support music businesses except for the federal programs which are for the moment closed yeah i would echo that that was kind of our interest in starting this uh, this even if it's a smaller fund at least identifying that needs i don't think the the um typical givers around here or even the most of the the uh the or the grant granting organizations see a, a business or being a sound engineer as being part of that creative scene or and not mm-hmm. recognizing that the venues are most people that are choosing to be music ven- venues might be comp- compromising better profits if they were just 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 a bar and so yeah. Helping tell that story of music venues being a, a social good too that that need that need in investment like other I- industries. So. Mm-hmm. I, I've actually likened it. I've always called them secular churches. You know, when you talk about this sort of civic engagement and community engagement that comes from them in a world where far fewer, certainly young people, go to church, it creates communities and it makes us realize that we're connected to each other and that's the basis of civilization and civic engagement. Um, It's also the um, idea that independent venues are the ones that are likely to fail. The, they're the ones that need support. And just like independent media, which we have two independent weekly newspapers that within four days of the shutdown of venues were asking people to donate to help them keep going. So if independent music and independent venues are powering independent media, you put all these pieces together, that's what has to be communicated out about how vital venues as a keystone are to this story, but that it's not the only part of the story, that we have to, we have to keep re-knitting the pieces together and say, you know, at last count, uh, the music industry is a $143 billion industry and that's from the Recording Industry Association report in 2018. But that failed to count a majority. We did assessment on the NAICS codes that were the sort of government coding system that music businesses would count for and found that 60% of our local music businesses were miscategorized. So $143 billion annual impact from an industry that is 60% unreported, you know, it it starts to add up. It's a very large industry. And like the airline industry that they bail out because it supports other businesses, we need to tell a larger story that says the music ecology as a whole, which includes musicians as music entrepreneurs, it includes you know, manufacturers and record labels and distribution platforms and all these other companies absolutely rely on the keystone of music venues and specifically independent music venues. That here, was my rant. You're here. Full, 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 full uh, agreement. Yes. We do, we do that. Yeah. Michael, I want to do a time check with you. We only have a few minutes less left. Are there questions coming in or can we stay in the conversation? Uh, I, I think we, we do have a good question. We've got a couple questions coming in. Um, one of them 
you know, gets to the question of, of aligning with your public, um, your public champions. So what advice or insight can you give? You know, part of what we wanted to showcase today were people who worked adjacent to government, but were not public officials. Mira and, and Eric, could you speak to that question of how you tell that story, which is very compelling, and how you connect that in with advocates and champions on the inside? Or has that been a, a challenge at all? No, the city has been, in principle, I think philosophically, very supportive. We created the city's first um, music policy council. We seeded that uh, towards the end of last year, and it was just starting to sort of build up its its work to rationalize all of our policies and enforcement and regulations relative to music um, because music is valuable. I think we've started that conversation. Um, there's very there's no public money um, available. That's part of the challenge. I think there's a good spirit of engagement. We're starting to work with the state government and through this COVID situation have gotten quite connected with the, our federal legislators. Um, it all needs to get better. I, I, we're not we're not Columbus. And uh, you can make, Jamie, you can make that a t-shirt um, because, because what, you, what you've created there is enviable. I think it's really remarkable and, and heartening. Yeah, I'll say we, we work pretty closely with the city and the city is kind of pretty far along in understanding, you know, that there's um, around some of the music strategy conversation. But I am really curious, and especially here in Columbus, talk about it was like, you know, we, we also, the state capital is in the city of Boise, but right. there's a pretty large gap between... Um, philosophical gap let's say, say that and so um but i'm curious if maybe that's a you, you know that and you know, i've been talking for a while that we need to start figuring out how to bridge that gap and this could be an op, a, a point in time when we really need to lean 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 in into that so well and again i, I don't mean to you know beat this beat this horse too much but you know and, and and we've talked about this in previous programs but again we need to remember that you know, the only analogy to where we are right now in terms of federal funding is in 2009 with the Recovery Act, which was, you know, around $700 billion. And now we've already seen one $2.2 trillion program go through. We're going to see another one, which my anticipation is will probably be more than that. And what we need, you know, my advice or my feeling for the community is just be cognizant that that money is going to be spent. And it's going to be spent on the organizations and institutions and interest groups that show up and make the case mm -hmm. to say, we need the money. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the through lines and, and what I've heard today, and, and frankly, what we heard last week from New Orleans and what we heard from Lisa in Denver, and I mean, what we've heard throughout this program is that, you know, a music is different and it's special and it's speech and it's empathy and it's humanity and it's all the things that music brings. So it's not just, you know, another interest group or another small business that's vulnerable. Uh, and then the second is, I think, Mira, you were really saying this very well, is, is, is how do we present the community as partnerships in what is going to be a very hard challenge for all of us? Mm -hmm. Reopening is going to be hard. And I think to the extent to which our music scenes and our commissions and our music advocates are able to be building those relationships. And Eric, I think it'd be amazing if you guys can, you know, crack the code with state government, but to be really saying we're signed up to be partners in this we need to know what that means, right? I mean, we need to have information, we need to have resources, we need to be existing. But you know, when we get over this stage or stage three or whatever stage we're gonna be in, when we get to the new normal that Kate was talking about, part of the hallmarks of that are gonna be people seeing music or mm -hmm. music being accessible again and, and, and being able to go out and feel like we've got that sense of normalcy coming back. So yeah. I think all these points are just so important. And, and again, I think the challenge that we all face collectively is, you know, I'm, I'm, I really hope that people that you who participate today in, in, in the meeting and people who observe the meeting and, and, and have written in, you know, find that this type of communication is, is helpful. I think, you know, certainly we feel a little overwhelmed by just how many Zoom meetings can you do in a week. And, and so that challenge of really needing to be working locally with our core people and building those relationships and talking to our policy community but then also doing this kind of information sharing is a very difficult thing to balance. Again, given that we're all in the same situation of being under-resourced and just not, you know, just really feeling that, that sort of that pressure. So, so it, it's really tricky, but I, I really just, you know, laud all y'all for, for everything you're doing. And, and we're going to be pulling all of these links into, again, the after email that will go out to program registrants today so they can follow up and, and we'll include your contact information 
Kate, do you have any closing thoughts or questions before we, we transition to close? Well, I just want to say that there's going to be a lot of need at the tables. And I loved what Jamie from Columbus said about, are you at the table? And it reminded me of a famous quote from the, the first black congresswoman in America, Shirley Chisholm, who had this famous quote that what said, if they don't give you a seat at the table, pull up a chair. And that is what we need to do right now, because the needs are going to be huge and people do not understand the music industry. And it is incumbent upon all of us to advocate for the people we represent and work with and love and make sure they've got a seat at that table. Kate, that's so well said. That's so well said. So I'm going to just a couple of closing thoughts. Um, again, thanks to all of our guests for joining us uh, today. And, and thanks to all of you, a, a ton of people who gave of your time to uh, listen to and participate in this conversation. We value that and appreciate it. Know you have a lot of things you can be spending your time on today. Um, as a reminder, the COVID-19 uh, Music Impact Study is still live at musiccitiestogether.com. A number of cities have used that to put that into the field. We're getting really interesting data back. So that's a free resource for anybody who's looking for, you know, kind of data tools that they could, uh, they could either adapt or, or they could just put out to their community. Next week's show is going to be kind of amazing. These are all amazing. I don't mean to be choosing shows as being more amazing. But next week, uh, we're going to be focusing on a couple of topics. One is on music education uh, in this era of shutdown. Jamie Duffy from Youth on Record from Denver is going to come and talk about what she is doing and what her team is doing of teaching artists and how they're relating to kids and a real focus on how they're making sure that their core team is feeling like they have purpose and things to do instead of just sitting at home and feeling the existential dread. So Jamie's gonna join us. Uh, we're gonna have Portia Sabine, who many of you know Portia, but now she's leading the Music Business Association and doing amazing work, just trying to figure out all the different macro pieces of the music industry and, and what this moment means for them and, and what this is gonna mean moving forward. So we're gonna check in with Portia and we're gonna also talk with Marianne Lombardi from Washington DC about some really exciting initiatives happening uh, here in the district uh, community related to creatives and to musicians. So. Um, with that, um, hit us up with email, comments, questions, very light constructive criticism. We're very vulnerable, so don't be mean, but hit us up at musicpolicyforum at gmail.com if you um, do have suggestions or thoughts uh, or just want to check in with us. Uh, again, we look forward to seeing many of you next week and uh, just keep doing what everybody's doing. So thank you so much. <laughs>